Well, we all have problems, don't we? <laughs> uh, we all have problems uh, from varying degrees of levels of intensity, levels of just various sorts of problems and issues and struggles. And um, when, when we start to think about our, our, our problems, our, our particular problems that are I'm not talking about nationally. Uh, there's, there's lots we can think on in that. Personally, personally, how do you deal with your problems? How, how are you going to work through those issues that are in your life? How are you going to work through that? What, what, what kind of plans will you put in place to... Um, to, to overcome that, to get on the other side of those. Uh, for, for many of us, and I know we talk about this like with guys, like we're, we're fixers. I hear a problem, a uh, wife will say, oh, I'm struggling with this, and I'm, I'm thinking about how to fix that. And so we're like, well, just do this. And, um, and everything's all better after that, right? And um, we're fixers. Uh, we want to fix the problems. And so what are those? What kind of qualities do you need to be able to rightly fix those issues, to, to get through those problems and, and to get out on top? Uh, how, do you, how are you going to work that? What does that look like? Uh, th there's a number of things that we will maybe want, uh, that w the qualities that we want that are going to help us to be able to navigate getting through difficult problems in our lives. Uh, there's things that, that we, uh, we want our kids to have, qualities that we want our kids to have. There's things that you have that you put down on your resume of like, oh, I'm strong in this and, and these kind of qualities or uh, the kind of things that I know, the qualities that the Marines tried to pour into me uh, as uh, to to be able to advance in life. Um, things like being a problem solver. You, you, you need to be a problem solver. Uh, things, qualities like uh, being able to multitask at once. Uh, and you be able to, to tackle this, and right? I mean, these are important qualities. Uh, that you're not just, when you have a problem in your life, you're not just dealing with one thing. There's multiple things that are going on. So multitask. Uh, be able to have a hard work ethic. That's important. Uh, I have a hard work ethic. You want to teach your kids to persevere, have determination, uh, self-reliance, uh, be able to uh, was just keep, keep hitting the wall. You learn how to punch through the wall eventually and just keep going, right? And how, what kind of qualities do you need? What kind of qualities does, uh, does the world tell us that you need to work through those issues and through those problems and uh, the fact that you want to be driven. Solve them. Uh, don't quit. Don't give up. Uh, important qualities. But, but how about this? What if I were to say to you that, that we want to encourage you to, uh, to have the qualities of brokenness and weakness? Would that sound just a little bit odd? Just think of that. What kind of things are you working on? I'm really trying to grow in weakness. That just, just doesn't sound right, does it? It just sounds off. And I get it. There's some of you that are, you've been, you're churched. You know the Bible. And you're like, well, no, no. Weakness is good. Uh, we want weakness. I know the Bible, and I know all those things. But we're so in our culture today. We're so affected by it. When I say weakness is the way, that just doesn't sound right. It just sounds a little off. Weakness is the way. If I were to say, I'm weak. Now, if I was in junior high, high school, they'd say, yeah, we, we know that, and we're just going to just pummel you all the more, right? And, uh, and today, if I were to say, well, I, I'm just weak, you'd be like, hmm, troubled soul, just keep my distance. Uh, there's something a little bit maybe 
different with weak people, broken people. And uh, they, they, these are people that just need therapy. Um, weak, broken. But, but what if, what if weakness really is the way? The, the, your issues, your problems that you are currently in in your life and you're trying to work on, you're working through, what if the answer to those issues was that you are weak and you're broken and, and that's what we want to highlight? Weakness is the way. It still just sounds a little bit different, doesn't it? What if the, what if God takes the world and, and he turns everything upside down? Well, yeah, maybe weakness is the way. Where, where, where would I get something like that? A, a concept that weakness is the way. We want to emphasize our weakness and our brokenness, and, and we want that as a quality to overcome our problems and, and issues. Turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is where I'm going to encourage you to turn in your Bibles. Where, where Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. One of two letters. This is number two. You have 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And talking about weakness. And typically, again, weakness is the thing that we, that, that's not what we put our we put our best foot forward. Uh, oh, I'm strong in this. Imagine getting a job interview. What are you strong in? Weakness. Thank you very much. Time's been good. <laughs> Next. Best foot forward is what we usually do. Here's what Jesus says. Well, Paul responded. Chapter 12, verse 9 of 2 Corinthians. But he, Jesus, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, so, so therefore, right, Paul says, like, because of what Christ has said, because of that, power is perfected, his grace is sufficient. Because of that, therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. So, so I take pleasure. I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. When was the last time you were talking to somebody, maybe in your small group, and they, they shared something, and they're like, you know, I'm just taking great pleasure in, in my difficulties right now? It's rare. Last line, for when I am weak, then I am strong. For when I am weak, then I am strong. A couple weeks ago, I was sharing about kind of those concentric circles, if you will, if you were to have an image in your mind of, of circles of friendships. And you, uh, we have with maybe three different layers. We have those on the outside. Uh, these are people, social media for the most part, or acquaintances uh, that are on the outside of, of friends. And then on the uh, on next in would be maybe those that, that know you much more by name. Maybe you'd even get a meal together here or there, or you'd see each other and once a year and you kind of catch up and, and things. Then you have a, an inner circle. And there's very, very, very few that, that ever get there. In other words, these are the people that, that get you. Uh, they, they can meet with you or see you and they're talking for just a moment and they're, they got to read already on, on how you're doing. So, something's off or, or, or he's, he's doing well or they, they, they get you. And one of the things we talked about with that was 
was we often will keep Jesus out here somewhere. I check in, and if he wants to check in with me, periodically, that's great. Um, but he's just kind of out there. And then sometimes we even let him in a little bit more. But, but I, for, for me and my walk, I want Jesus here. I want Jesus in the middle, in the center of my life. That, that, that all my ups and downs, there, there's, there's no shame. I, I can be me. I can be, I can be John. Uh, the, he gets me. I think that's what Paul is getting at. If he's depending on Christ and he's he's resting in the fact that Christ gets him and then that that his power is perfected in weakness and and he knows everything about him. And so he's going to rejoice in, he's gonna take pleasure in, and he's gonna boast in the weaknesses, because he knows that when he's weak, he's, he's strong. Um, Christ is the center of his life. I, I wonder how many begin the journey with God and then stop short of closeness because of the fact that, uh, that they're too full of themselves to, to let God in. <laughs> Over the next couple of weeks, what I want us to do is to, um, we're going to look at two individuals, one this morning, and then uh, over the next just couple of weeks, uh, we're going to spend a little more time looking at the, the life of Peter. Uh, and that's going to be prior to us going into the book of First Peter. The author of First and Second Peter is Peter, the apostle, and so I, I want us to get a, a better picture of Peter, uh, and so it's going to bring a little more whole light to the book of First Peter, and, um, but, but Peter is a, a man that was, uh, was, was weak and, and broken, and we're going to see that the, the man we're going to look at this morning, in fact, uh, is, is a man that is is weak and, and broken as well. A man by the name of Jacob. Jacob, we find in Genesis, this is the very first book of the Bible. In fact, you can turn to Genesis chapter 32 right now. Uh, Genesis chapter 32, first book of the Bible. And uh, so that should be easy to find. Uh, Genesis chapter 32. And... Uh, and as you turn in there, let me tell you a little bit about Jacob. It's going to be helpful for some context to, to Jacob. Jacob is a rascal. Uh, he is, uh, he comes out of a, a broken, what we would maybe call a dysfunctional family. Uh, this is, uh, the family really was a, a mess in many ways. If you know your Bible at all and you know Jacob, you, you may remember him as uh, with Jacob and his brother Esau. Jacob and Esau. Jacob is the lying skunk that, uh, that ripped off the blessings for, that were intended for his brother Esau, he took for himself. And, and to do that, he deceived his father, he lies, he cheats, he's, uh, this guy's a scoundrel. Um, <laughs> He deceives, he lies, he's conniving, uh, just deceitful. He, he works the system. Uh, he's, he, he swindles people. He's, um, and, and if you read before chapter 32, one of the things you, you, you discover is when he cheats Esau, his brother, out of the blessing, out of his inheritance, basically, is... Uh, Esau has every intent to now kill him. Uh, it is, is a major blow to the family, and, and what Jacob has done is, is unforgivable, and I'm just going gonna, gonna to kill him. And he has every intent to, to murder him. And so Jacob flees. Uh, he runs for his life. 
On his way out, uh, angels show up in a dream, and, and Jacob continues on the run, and he goes and lives with his uncle Laban for some 20 years, and he swindles his uncle, and it has it back, and it's it's dysfunctional family. And, and, and he's, he's the deceiver. Jacob works the system. Um, he's the kind of guy that when there's a problem in front of him, he figures out how to work the system to get out on top. He's a problem solver. He has this vague kind of relationship with God. Uh, you may even want to say he's kind of like, uh, he's secular with a Christian glaze. He works the system for his benefit. And, and one might even ask the question, so, so how, how does God use a, a wretch like that? How, how does God use, use a man like that who is an imposter Jacob is, when we come to chapter 32, uh, he is called of God to go back home. Go back into the promised land. He's going to go into his homeland. He now has, uh, since some 20 years have passed, he has uh, not just one wife, but two, a couple of servants, 11 children. He has a large family. He has a bundle of money. He has truckloads of supplies to his name. His 401k is strong. He, uh, he, he's made it. That's how we would say it. He, he's done well for himself. And now he's heading home, but he's got a problem as he heads home. Well, what's his problem as he heads back home where he was 20 years ago? His brother you guys are a lot better than first service. They're like, is, is it Jesus? No, it's not Jesus. Um, it's, <laughs> his problem is his brother. He still has a problem with his brother. Last he's heard from his brother, he wants to murder him. He's going to kill him. So an important lesson that we'll see out of this chapter is that the problem we see is not always the problem that God sees. We tend to see problems from a certain perspective, and then we work hard to try to fix that and, and so that we're going to be happier and we're going to be relieved of the trouble that we're in. And, but, but God will oftentimes see something completely different and answer very differently than how we expect. The problem that we see is not always the problem that God sees. So when we come into chapter 32, in just verses 1 and 2, God is, is going to be communicating with Jacob that he's with him. So take comfort. Here's, here's what he says. Jacob went on his way and God's angels met him. When he saw them, Jacob said, this is God's camp. So he called the place Mahanaim. And so th there's this, this place where, remember when, when Jacob left, angels show up. And, and then as he comes back into the promised land, the angels show up. And this is God's camp. And he's not on his way. He's not there yet. He's on his way. And, uh, and, and so he's heading there. This should be a source of encouragement that God is going to be with him. But keep in mind, as we start to unpack and start to look through this chapter, Jacob is a conniving, deceitful, and but he has been working the system. He has been leaning on his problem-solving skills all of his life. He's clever. He's... His salvation is through working it out and fixing things. And now he's in a pickle. So he's going to try to work it out, figure it out. Whatever it takes to, to get out and come out on top. 
That's what Jacob, his whole life has been about. Verse 3 through 5, Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the territory of Edom. He commanded them, you are to say to my Lord Esau, this is what your servant Jacob says. I have been staying with Laban, and I have been delayed until now. Uh, 20 years. Uh, I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female slaves. I have sent this message to inform my Lord in order to seek your favor. So he has now been, he sent out scouts. He's got a problem. His brother wants to murder him. That's, that's a problem. <laughs> I'm not sure what problems you're facing today. This is a serious one. H- how is he going to fix that? So he sends uh, scouts ahead with some goods and says, tell them to, hey, here's all these gifts for you and, and let them know that Jacob, your servant, is, is on his way. How's that going to go? Well, verse 6 through 8, listen to the response. So when the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau. He's coming to meet you. And he has 400 men with him. He has 400 men. If you read a little bit earlier, you'd know that there's around 400 men wiped out another city earlier. There's an army that's on their way. Hey, send out some scouts and send some gifts and, and let's just test the water and put our toe in the water and let's see. How, how, uh, how's Esau? I've, certainly time heals everything, right? Your brother's on his way and he has 400 men with him gulp. Verse 7, Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. Greatly afraid is, is powerfully, overwhelmingly fearful. The word distressed is literally, it's the idea of being tied in knots, cramped, it's debilitating news. Esau is coming with 400 men. You're finished. What's a solution? How, how do you fix that problem? If you're giving advice, Jacob uh, posts, my brother who wants to kill me is on his way with 400 men. What should I do? How would you respond? Let me ask you, what advice would you give to Jacob? Jacob, wow, that's quite a pickle. He's working the system. He's, he's thinking. He's considering all of his options. These are things that, that will weigh on him as he wrestles this over and over and over again, this crushing weight of the fact that they're about to be wiped out Because it says, he divided the people with him into two camps, along with the flocks, herds, and camels. He thought, if Esau comes to one camp and attacks it, the remaining one can escape. It's possible that if I split us up into two, 50%, 50-50, I I split us up, uh, at least wise, maybe half of us will survive. The other half can can get away. That's not good. It's the best he can come up with. Keep in mind, the problem we see is not always the problem that God sees. Now, one of the things he's doing is he's dividing everything up into halves and and is, is hopeful that Half of them will be able to survive. And then he does what I, I would say probably most of us, not all of us do, is we, we pray. So he, he, he prays. Many of us, we have a problem. We 
try to figure it out and we wrestle with it and we feel anxiousness and we stay up all night and can't sleep and we eat terribly and we drink lots of coffee and we try to figure it out. We work it out in our minds over and over again and try to figure out the solution to it. And then along the way, we'll probably also pray. He does that. Verse 9. Then Jacob said, God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, go back to your land and to your family and I will cause you to prosper. He's reminding God, God, do you remember you told me to go back? <laughs> you're, you're the one that told me to go back. Verse 10, I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. Indeed, I crossed over the Jordan with my staff and now I have become two camps. Please. Do you, do you hear the... Please. Rescue me. R rescue me from my brother Esau for I'm afraid of him. Otherwise he may come and attack me, the mothers and their children. You have said... I will cause you to prosper and I'll make your offspring like the sand of the sea, too numerous to be counted. And he's like, God, do you remember you made this promise and now I'm heading back and... So he cries out for rescuing. He, he, he's growing. Jacob is growing in his sense of inability to fix everything on his own strength. But just because he prayed doesn't mean everything's changed. Still trying to figure out what to do. Verse 13 picks up. He spent the night there and took part of what he had brought with him as a gift for his brother Esau. Listen to this gift. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milk camels with their young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 male donkeys. Will that appease him? <laughs> Certainly. That is, I mean, that, he's got a whole zoo. This will appease him. <laughs> this will fix everything. Verse 16, he entrusted them to his slaves as separate herds and said to them, go on ahead of me and leave some distance between the herds. And he told the first one, when my brother Esau meets you and asks, who do you belong to? Where are you going? And whose animals are these ahead of you? Then tell him this. They belong to your servant, Jacob. They are a gift sent to my Lord Esau. And look, he is behind us. He also told the second one, the third and everyone who was walking behind the animals. Say the same thing to Esau when you find him. You were also to say, look, your servant Jacob is right behind us. For he thought, for here's what Jacob thought, I want to appease Esau with the gift that is going ahead of me. After that, I can face him and perhaps he will forgive me. So the gift was sent on ahead of him while he remained in the camp that night. During the night, Jacob got up and took two, his two wives, his two slave women, and 11 sons and crossed the ford of Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream along with his, all his possessions, and he was left alone. So Not much has changed after his prayer. He's still trying to work up this plan. And so the, the best he comes to, right, is I'm going to send these all ahead and set them in, in groups. And so one group comes and they're like, hey, who are you and who you come from and where are you going? Well, your servant, Jacob. Not your conniving brother. No, no, your servant, Jacob. He's given this as a gift and and he's behind us, but, but there's still more coming for you, oh kind Esau. And so he's, he's been working this. This is best he can come up with. He's working the system. Even, he's even prayed now. He's done everything he can in his power. 
He's managed the problem to the degree that he can. He's, he's prayed, but he's not really changed yet. So what's the solution for him? What's the, how do you fix this? We're all fixers. We get this. He's in, he's in, he's in a bind. This is terrible. So work through it. Figure it out. But the problem we see is not always the problem God sees. What does God see as the problem? Hmm. I, I wish there was a, a, a break in the verses uh, of a new verse in verse 24. So there would be 24 and then a break and then the rest of the, the sentence. There would be a stop. It, it says that Jacob was left alone. And, and then God is going to answer how do you think God's going to answer? A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the life of uh, Jehoshaphat, uh, and Jehoshaphat is under attack, and they pray, and God answers, delivers, and pff, God, amazing, and wow, God always moves. It's awesome. I love it, and I love how God answers in such radical ways. So how is God going to answer Jacob? Jacob is left alone. He's left in his own thoughts. He's, he's left there in the middle. It's, 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 and and here's, here's how God answers. Jacob was left alone, verse 24, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Excuse me? Is this not one of the oddest verses? You've, you've ever read in the Bible? What? Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak? Excuse me? All night long. Who is this man? Scholars believe it to be the pre-incarnate Christ. Hosea chapter 12 tells us it's an angel. Angel of the Lord. God shows up and, 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 and wrestles. What? I'm so confused. It seems to me like when we're in a pickle or in a bind, you, you call out to God, and, and, and how I expect God to answer is with, with comfort, with, with encouragement. I... I Angel shows up and, and, and read Psalm 23 to him. He, he gave comfort. He, he spoke words of peace. Not wrestle. Not on my radar when I'm praying and asking God for, for mercy. I don't always understand why God answers the way he does. All night long, Jacob is worn down. He's wrestled with this man. He's already, consider where Jacob is at. The situation he is in, this is the worst situation he's ever found himself in. He has already been running. He has all kinds of all these other issues that have been going on. And now he's, he's heading to where he thought God wanted him to go. And his brother is coming out and he's believing that his brother is going to kill him. And everything is lost. Everything's done. It's, and, and so he's been working through this. He's, he's been trying to figure out the, the, the missing piece so that things are settled and he's happier and everything's okay. And, and so he, he's prayed to God, and, and now all night long he's wrestling. He's being worn down all the more. You, th you think, I, I would have thought he'd be responding more like um, Elijah. Give him some sleep and give him some food. <laughs> all night long, sleepless night, wrestling. Ever wrestled? In the Marines, when we were on a ship, we would go down into the reefer decks down below, lay out mats, and for hours, 
on in uh, thumb wrestle. And uh, no, we would, uh, um, man, you would, we would wrestle. And, and it was sweaty. It was uh, bloody. It was uh, just steam. It was, it was, it was exhausting. Just for a couple hours. Jacob is already at his wit's end, and now God sends an angel and wrestles all night long with him. The problem we see is not always the problem that God sees, and and he knows exactly what the problem is. God does. God, God knows how to answer. He knows how to engage with precision. Verse 25 and 26, when the man saw that he could not defeat him, he struck Jacob's hip socket as they wrestled and dislocated his hip. Then he said to Jacob, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now, (laughs) more, more confusing verses. Is the angel whipped? Uh, no. One touch. One touch. Ding. Crippled. Something more going on here than... Oh, the angel tapped. No. What's going on? With one touch, the, the, the angel touches his hip socket and he's dislocated and he's crippled. The very power that weakens Jacob is the power that can heal him. So Jacob is at his, is in the, the end of his rope. He's, he's finished. He's exhausted. He's done everything he can. He's done everything in his power that he can possibly do. And so he clings to this man, this angel, and he dares not let him go. He can cling to him. So watch what happens, verse 27. What is your name, the man asked. Jacob, he replied. Your name will no longer be Jacob, he said. It will be Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he answered, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. Jacob then named the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, he said, yet my life has been spared. So in verse 27, what is your name, the man asked? Jacob, this is not the angel going, Oh man, it's dark out. I hope I got the right guy. (laughs) No, he has a new name. Your name will no longer be Jacob. It will be Israel. He struggles with God. Jacob has a history. His history is all about struggling over his whole life. He struggled with his father, his brother, his uncle, his family. He's worked everything out in his power, in his strength. And now he has wrestled with God and he has finally had to tap. One touch in the hip, I'm finished. He taps. He'd been whipped, and so he clings in desperation and brokenness. We know that even just because of the name of the place, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been spared. He spared my life. Desperation, brokenness before the Lord. Look at the last two verses. The sun shone on him as he passed by Penuel, 
limping because of his hip. And then what seems like a little footnote, this is why still today the Israelites don't eat the thigh muscle that is at the hip socket because he struck Jacob's hip socket at the thigh muscle. A little footnote, you're like, okay, good to know. I'm going to be a butcher. Um, it's not a, there's more going on here, right? Jacob is desperate. Israel now is desperate. He's totally tapped out. He couldn't fix it on his own. The hip dislocation is the moment that Jacob was done. He's finished. He's wrecked. His plans are no longer going to work. His plans are no longer going to get him through it. He has nothing else to, to give. He, he's limping now. He, he, can't even, he can't even run from Esau. What God gave was just what Jacob needed. It was the solution to the real problem. Because Jacob doesn't get fixed here, he gets broken. So even if you were to read along in chapter 33, he goes out to meet his brother, but guess who's in the lead? It's Jacob. He leads the way. Complete opposite. His limp from here on is going to be a constant reminder that God is in control of his life. God is in control. John Calvin wrote, God fights against us with his left hand and for us with his right hand. When we quit fighting, when we've been soundly beaten, God says you've won. Brokenness, weakness, walking with a limp. Strong in body and weak in soul before wrestling with God. And now Jacob is now weak in body and strong in soul. Jacob, Israel, will now lead with a limp. A reminder that God's in control and God always answers. It isn't going to be by Jacob's power, by his work, by his answers, but by God's. Remember we started in 2 Corinthians 12? L listen again to this. But Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, and hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Weakness really is the way. I wonder who here is willing to walk with a limp the rest of your life so that Christ will be close. It comes through brokenness. 
a brokenness before the Lord. It's, it's the quality we need. We need the Lord. Perhaps you've been working really hard on your problem. Trying to figure that out. Every, every option, every angle, you've, you've tried to readdress and, and, and figure it out and make it happen. All on your power, on your strength. You've worked really hard. But perhaps what you need is to stop fighting. Stop trying to do it on your own. You need Jesus. Because weakness really is the way. I can't. It's so counterculture to the rest of the world. So completely upside down. Let's close our Bibles and do you bow your heads? Just asking you to do that for a moment because I wonder how many of you are trying to work it. Figuring it out on your power and your way. Sure, maybe you've prayed, but not really trusted. I'm wondering how many are going to leave here today limping. It is actually my prayer that every one of us will limp out of here today. Imagine a people that have been so impacted by Jesus that, that we, uh, we don't have it in ourselves. We, we look to the Lord. God, we come before you and we need you. It is ludicrous of a thought as the world looks in on Christians that, that we would boast in our weakness. But apart from you, we can do nothing. We need you. God, I pray that your spirit would, would move upon us, that we will trust you, we will turn to you, we will call out to you, and that you will do whatever it takes, God, for us to know you, the power of the resurrection. God, I pray that you would have your way in us. Have your way in me. I want to walk with you. Lord, may we be a church that walks with you. That limps with you. God, thank you for loving us so. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.